but um, I, I work in the um, school board over there, so I have the education platform as well.
Hello. Hey. Hello. Thank you very much. No, really. Bonus. I tell everybody this that is in any um I'm on stage with this person. Okay. Uh-huh. I'm really I work at Indian Earth now I'm on this and really making OT and instrumental and general party and transition. Good. It's really important. And then, how many of those things on your list are all OT? That's exactly right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I actually hear from uh, OTs from around the country who have, who want to infuse more of this stuff into what they're doing. So, I, you know, I think there's a lot of interest. You know, it's consistent. This whole idea of participation is rooted in uh, OT philosophy. And, you know, a lot of more work on participation has been done in in the OT realm than there has been in special ed itself. So really working at opening the schools. Uh, yeah. Saying, okay, why is OT not on the IEP? I don't know what grade they took OT off this child's OT IEP, but we have to we have to put them back on and we have to put them back on It's so important. And um I'm actually with the AOTA's community mm -hmm. practice mm -hmm. for a transition plan. Good. Good. Yeah, we've got a colleague that works with us at the Beach Center who's an OT, and he got a, an AOTA mini grant to uh, uh, begin working on uh, a version of the self-determined learning model of instruction uh, focused on employment outcomes. He's interested in employment outcomes. So. Nice. Very exciting. Well, I think, you know, and then I, like I just, uh, the transition specialist, and I'm really anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, good for you. Well, and of course, I may I may frame these things in terms of teaching, but there's not a thing that I'm going to talk about this afternoon that can't be done in a speech context, that can't be done in an OT context, or you know, I mean, it's just it's just you know, infusing these things into what you do is is the key to it. So, Thank you. yeah, yeah. Well, I think maybe we might, we might as well move ahead and re, re, reinforce those of you who are punctual and here and, you know, 
no telling how many we lost. They'd let them go to lunch and they just, you know. Um, just by way of reminder, here's the wiki website. Uh, and then I uh, have put on the, the last slide, I'll put up uh, the, the website again. Uh, it's really the only thing you need to have to get to everything else. <laughs> everything else will be on a, a PowerPoint once you get into the wiki. So, so that's our uh, that's the wiki uh, page. Um, so we're going to talk about um, assessment uh, and uh, student involvement and talk a little bit about in infusing um, instruction on these component elements of self-determined behavior into um, instruction in everything. And then, and then we'll close out the day uh, talking about the self-determined learning model of instruction. So um, take a break, we're on till four, although I think there's a uh, drawing or something for uh, the gifts, so uh, I'll wrap up before that. Um, we'll try to break around two, I think, probably a little after two. So there are a number of uh, measures of self-determination that you can, uh, you have access to. Uh, and as it happens, uh, they're all available for no cost. Um, the, um, so the, the sort of oldest version that's been around is something that we developed in the, in the 90s called the ARC Self-Determination Scale. Uh, it's a measure of student self-determination. We needed a tool that we could use to evaluate the effectiveness of interventions. Can't know whether interventions work unless you can measure what it is they're supposed to work with, right? But we also wanted to make sure that it was something that would be useful for um, teachers in their day-to-day -day, uh, planning and uh, instructional support, so identify uh, where students have relative strengths in issues of self-determination, where they might need more instruction, more practice. You know, I say teachers, I was just talking with somebody who's an OT. It could just as easily be used in that context. If you're a family member, it could just as easily be used to take a look at where you can support uh, issues around self-determination at home. Um, it, um, in my experience with all of these, but more so with this, just because I've lived with it longer, students like participating in the assessment of self-determination. You're asking them to talk about what they do well, about what they like, about what they're good at, about areas around choice and preference, and, you know, and so by and large, it, it's intended to be a process that's, uh, on the side of these strengths based. Uh, it's not intended to end up with, uh, you know, uh, you can standardize it. We have to, we have to be able to get a, a more of a standardized score uh, when we're doing research, but I, you know, it's not something I particularly think is necessary to do uh, with this. So the ARC self-determination scale, there's, it gives you an overall measure of self-determination and then gives you subscale in and you can see the, the domain, so autonomy, and then some subdomains under there around independence and acting on the basis of preference, interests, beliefs, and values. Um, and then a self-regulation section that looks at uh, interpersonal cognitive problem solving, means and problem solving, goal setting, and task performance. And then a section that's, uh, th th this area is called psychological empowerment. It's asking about you know, it's, it's sort of these broader issues of locus of control. Do you, do you believe that if you do something, it will matter? And do you believe that you can do uh, these things? So it's about the beliefs associated with acting in a self-determined manner. And then self-realization is kind of a broad area looking at self-awareness and self-knowledge uh, and uh, understanding yourself. So the ARC self-determination scale 
was designed and normed for group or individual administration. So you can do it with a classroom, you can do it with a small group of young people, you can do it with uh, individually. You know, if a student needs more extensive supports uh, than probably individual administration. Uh, basically what we did, we knew that we, we normed this for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So we knew that there was gonna be a whole array of abilities around communication, around how, you know, uh, how well students can respond. So it was, it was normed with whatever it took for the student to participate, right? So you can really do whatever you need to do. Uh, you can read items to students. You can, you can uh, record what students' answers are. You know, the one drawback to all this measurement I'll mention now is that it relies on student self-report about what they think about something. So there are going to be some students for whom self-report measures are just not valid and reliable. And, you know, we have some ideas about how we go about gathering information for supporting uh, understanding self-determination. We've uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that with the next instrument I talk about. But, you know, uh, we've used uh, this quite extensively. And, and, and the other thing about the ARC scale is it's been then subsequently normed with students with autism, uh, with students uh, in, with learning disabilities, with students. So uh, pretty much uh, has utility across the board in terms of kids with disabilities. Um, uh, there are, the back of the protocol has a set of scoring steps and you come out, you map the, the raw scores on a, a chart, kind of a graph. So you can see in those areas, getting back to here, you can get information on, you know, uh, where students have skills in these domain areas, interaction with the environment, or post-school directions. So you graph out the raw scores and you can end up with just a graph that shows you where students have relative strengths and where instruction might be a good place to start. And again, I, we see it as a conversation with between the, the support person, the teacher, the, you know, related services, a family member, and the student. So it, it, we, we encourage that kind of a conversation. It's a student self-report measure, so students are reporting their responses. So it's, a, it's an opportunity to open a conversation. You can look at areas where students uh, have uh, instructional need and, and begin to, to plan. It's not at all intended to be prescri prescriptive or diagnostic. It's simply a tool to provide direction for discussions about self-determination and transition-related goals around issues of self-determination and instruction around issues of self-determination. Normed between ages of 13 and 22. Um, I, I, you know, I think you could use it with younger children just to begin to have conversations, uh, and there's no reason not to. Um, if you're responsible for a program, if you're, you know, an administrative role, you can, you can take it the next step. You can standardize the raw scores and create standard scores. And you look at where uh, groups of, of students might fall in terms of uh, uh, against norms, same age norms kinds of things. So it, it has utility for program evaluation as well as in our case, as researchers, we use it to evaluate the impact of interventions. But that's always, of course, as a group, not individually. Uh, so we've, we've made it as, as uh, flexible as possible. So, you know, I just mentioned you can, you can plate the scale and never score it and just have a conversation about what student thought about that. You can, uh, you can, you can just deal only with, you can convert it to percent positive scores that let students look at where they have strengths. Um, or you can complete all components. It is available at a website um, that the University of Oklahoma maintains. It's the Zero Center, that's Z-A-R-R-O-W. So if you Google Zero Center Self-Determination, and I've got this website on a final slide uh, so you'll have the, the Zero Center website uh, along with this. 
there's all sorts of uh, materials around issues of self-determination. This assessment, the, the protocol in a PDF form, and the, um, uh, the procedural guidelines for how to administer and, and score items are in PDF form. They're uh, available for download and use as you wish. Um, as well as a number, we're going to be talking about the self-directed IEP in a moment. That's part of a series called the Choice Maker Series. That's a set of uh, uh, instructional and support materials around student involvement, the self-directed IEP, but also setting goals, creating action plans. Those are available in PDF form, completely downloadable from the Zero Center website. They've they've uh, they've they've pulled in other transition related materials that, that are available. So it's a great resource uh, and all of it's free. Um, so so that's the ARC self-determination scale. Now we were we we had used the ARC self-determination scale in our work uh, and it was fine except more and more we were we were working in class wide and then school wide contexts. And try as we might to alter it, we could never get it to where it was very helpful for students without disability, because students without disability just sort of scored at the top of the, uh, the, the register on across the board. So it really didn't differentiate. Uh, we did come up with a short version of the ARC scale that um, uh, uh, was somewhat predictive of differences. But by and large, uh, it's been helpful in the education of students with disabilities, but as we moved into whole school and classroom-wide stuff, it became less helpful if we had students without disabilities in the context. So we, we applied for and eventually got a, a large grant to develop a new measure. And, and that measure, uh, we actually talk about the self-determination inventory system uh, because we have multiple measures and we're uh, going to build it out. So... I'll just talk a little bit about that. And I'll just point out that this measure is uh, fully available at self-determination.org. So we, we purchased the self-determination.org website, and that's where all of uh, this information and access, and I'll tell you a little bit about. So we wanted, first of all, to have a student self-report version, just as we had with the ARC. We, we think that student, we, we, we've got to have information from the students on this. It's, it's not acceptable, if at all possible, uh, not to have that. So that was our first task. I'll talk a little bit about a, uh, what we call uh, uh, an adult report version. That's the same items that are on the, self, the student self-report version, but they're uh, reworded so that uh, you're, you as an adult, so that could be a parent, or a teacher, or a related or a, a related services, whoever wanted to use it, uh, asks the questions about and answers the, the questions about a student. So that version is specific to uh, an adult in a student's lives responding on behalf of that student. Now, if you have both the student self-report and the adult report, you get a sense of where there's agreement, where there's disagreement, where you, you know, it maybe gives you a little better picture depending on who it was that completed. If you've got a, a family member who completed the adult ver report version, then you get information that teachers don't often have or school-based personnel. But, you know, kids behave differently at school than they do at home. And so there's information teachers know that parents don't know. So it, we, we kind of operate on that. The more perspectives you can get, uh, the, the better off. Now, uh, uh, you know, so we're, we're trying to create a, a complete system. Uh, and next on our agenda are um, uh, how, how we would do uh, measurement for students with more extensive support needs for whom self-report measures are not appropriate or applicable. Now, with the adult report, if a student has quite extensive support needs and, and can't complete the, the self-report version, an, an adult can still report on their perspectives on that student. So you can get some 
some measure or some indicator and it, it, it would help uh, some. But there are other ways we think that we can go about trying to capture information about relative self-determination for students uh, with more extensive support needs and it's part of what we want to build out. So uh, the, the ARC scale, uh, one of the disadvantages, it's like 148 items. Um, and uh, depending on how long, you know, the, what kind of support students need, if you're having to read items to them, it, you know, it can take a while sometimes to administer. Um, the, so we, we set out to uh, uh, create the, the self-determination inventory to try to capture the information that you could get from the ARC self-determination scale, but also to make it shorter. So there's only 21 items. Um, Three, three sections, so volitional action, what is it, and that's a, a student uh, initiation of uh, self-determined action, student uh, interest preferences, and then agentic action, which uh, involves around goal setting and goal attainment and, and uh, other areas of kind of acting to make uh, change, and then an area we call uh, action control beliefs that's about the beliefs that you have about yourself and you're uh, acting on the environment. 21 items, it takes about 10 minutes to finish, give or take, student support needs, but there's some features in it that make it easier for students with uh, cognitive or other uh, disability. Normed uh, students ages 13 to 22, uh, importantly, it was, we normed it with students with and without disabilities. So this is a measure that uh, is valid and reliable for young people 13 to 22 across disability categories, but also without disability. So I mentioned to you, we, we've got a big project now in inclusive high schools in Delaware and Maryland, where we're implementing the self-determined learning model of instruction as a tier one intervention for all students. So we can go in and we can evaluate the impact of that using this measure because it's normed with kids uh, across uh, disability categories as well as kids without disabilities. We also have a number of online accessibility features. I haven't mentioned, this is fully online. So there's no paper pencil version. This is a, 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 a web-based assessment. And we did that because we can build in universal design features that you can't build into, you know, paper, pencil, PDFs. Um, so as I'll show you in a minute, well, I've got all these things. So uh, this is when you go to self-determination.org, you're going to see a, uh, the website. It's going to give you a choice. So this may be in a later slide, but I'm going to say it anyway because it's, a little bit confusing. So there's, there's a, a, you can click on what's called, we call it single use uh, version or the dashboard version. So let me give you an explanation. The single use version is free. You click on it, uh, you give us some, uh, you, you, you have to have, you don't have to have account, you just have to enter uh, an email address and a uh, and a username, it, and, and you can then uh, go in. The data, I will tell you, data is stored, but no personally identify, uh, and identified information is stored. So the, the data are stored for future use for analyzing and improving the systems and looking at that, but none of the, no personal information is uh, uh, stored. Um, so, um, by single use, what we mean is if you're wanting to, to sit down with a student and have that student go through the self-report measure, you can do that. You get to the end of that, and there's um, a printout that gives information about student areas of strengths and, and limitations. You'll see that in a minute, or areas of instructional need. Um, because of the way that the the, the system was uh, uh, developed, the computing was set up, once you exit that, it just goes away. I mean, you don't have, you no longer have access, and, and there's no way to do something like keep track of whether a student, what they scored at the start of the year versus after the year. I'll show you how you save that information for your own use, 
But once you're done with it and you leave that website, there's no way to get that back. You can use that if you have 30 students in your class. You can use it 30 times with each, once with each student. But you're only going to do it one student at a time. And it's, you're not going to be able to save more than a PDF of the outcomes, okay? It's free. You can use it as often as you want. If you want to track student progress, you can administer it at the first of the year. You can save the PDF, in, in, as I'll show you in a minute, and then you can, you can give them again at the end of the year and, and save that PDF. So it's just, it's on you. Now then, did you have a question or you were? Yeah. That's right, exactly. That's, you know, I, I still am not in the mentality of thinking about that. You know, you can just take pictures of things. Uh, but um, the, um, but what we needed it to do was to be able to do things that allow you to do research on interventions and stuff. We needed it to be able to track across time. We needed to be able to say, okay, you know, uh, there was a mean score of this for this school district or, you know, aggregate group data kind of thing. So we built out another system, and that's what we call the dashboard version. The dashboard version lets you do all of those things. You set up. Uh, organizations and structures and teachers you can say okay in this classroom in that classroom and you can you can uh, it'll save data across multiple measurements whatever else it's kind of things that you need for program evaluation probably or for uh, research there was a lot of cost for us associated with building out that dashboard and there is still some time required for us to actually set up your organization and do all that. So there is a, we, we had to, there is a, a cost associated with using the dashboard version that we negotiate. And usually it's just research teams. I, to this point, schools haven't purchased or wanted to, to do it at a, a level. Now I could see where a district might be interested in being able to track and be willing to spend. We've got it, we've got it costed at a fairly reasonable rate. Uh, but that allows you to do things that the, this uh, uh, single-use version was. I say that just because single-use makes it sound like you can only use it once and then never use it again, right? And that's not the case. You can use it as many times as you want. It's just not going to be able to track stuff. It's not going to be those kinds of things, and you're going to have to print out or take a picture or some way capture the information. Okay, so this is what it looks like. We've built in some universal design features. Uh, there are 21 items. They are all on, on this kind of a scale from disagree to agree. Now, understand that there are no right or wrong answers. So when you, when you, uh, when you ask the question, I know what I do best, there isn't a right or wrong answer. The students either know or feel like they don't know that or that, you know. Uh, and so we wanted some way to show that uh, an answer had been made without getting into the red to green kind of things, because it, it implied right or wrong. So what we have, I think I have, uh, so first of all, along the top, you've got a progress bar that shows you, in this case, you're one-fourth of the way through when you finish this page, right? So it just gives you a sense uh, of what's going on there. Okay, so when an item is unanswered, there's a gradient uh, that goes from a, a light blue up to a dark blue, right? So that one right there has not been answered yet. And it's just a, a, a visual marker of uh, the fact that this hasn't been answered yet. Uh, we have, if you see on some of the words, you can see they have the little dots underneath them. More complex words, we tried to keep the reading level around fourth grade, but any complex words, you've got a pop-up, uh, you can click that and you get a in-text definition of the word. Um, one of the things we're using revenue generated, so the revenue for this dashboard version goes into an account that helps pay for the personnel to enter for the users, but also will pay for future um, um, advancement. And, and so one of the things we're wanting to do there is, for example, have that be a voice. You can, you can hear what the definition is and it's supposed to just have a pop-up text box, right? Um, so uh, each item uh, has a play button next to it that if you click on that, it will read 
uh, the uh, question aloud to you, and you can click on it as many times as you'd like. And we actually hired uh, a, a broadcaster for the, from the local Ka Kansas public radio station. So this is very sophisticated sounding readings of these items, right? Um, and then when you click, so this isn't, you know, some students with cognitive disabilities have difficulty with the traditional Likert kind of uh, four or five point scale, right? Uh, and those scales are a problem because there's, you know, the difference between agree uh, uh, or uh, agree and mostly agree and neutral, those aren't equal. <laughs> and, you know, if you're like me, every time I fill those out, I want to have more gradation, gradation so I can actually say how I feel. You know, Goodreads, how many of you have Goodreads account? They've got five stars you can give. I'm forever wanting to give a book three and a half stars. You know, because three doesn't, that's too harsh, and four wasn't good enough. So, you know, so this is a slider, and it, there's no, it, 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 when we, when we score it, we go from zero to 99. But there's no, you just move this slider along there. So when you click on uh, a, a place, what it does is it changes to solid to show that you've completed it. And then it, it ends where you clicked on it. And then it gives you a checkbox that says you finished this item. So it's, again, just a visual way of, of showing that you've finished the item. You can, you can, if you've clicked on something and then you make a change, a change you say, no, that's probably, you can, you can keep clicking until you're, you're finalized, until you're, you're happy with it. Um, so, um, so that's the student self-report version. Um, the, uh, the parent-teacher report, I called it an adult report, PTR is what we're calling it now, I guess. Um, and we actually have just finished an adult report, which is for adults, mainly adults with cognitive disabilities. Some adults with autism might benefit from that. And it'll be up and loaded up. We're just finishing that one up. So it's another tool. So I guess it's a good thing we call this the parent-teacher report because it would be confusing. Uh, but the adult report is for adults. Uh, so normed from like 18 through however old we can get people. Um, the parent-teacher report is the same items. They mirror the student items. You can see here, if a student item said, I have what it takes to reach my goals, the parent-teacher report says, this student has what it takes to reach his or her goals. So, uh, And it's a way to get information. You have the same accessibility features in that version, um, but it's, it's specific to a student. So you as a teacher, you as a uh, parent would be responding to a specific student. Uh, so now, oh, here, this, so this is what that I mentioned to you, one-time SDI for students, so that's the single-use version. Again, it, it's confusing in that you can use it a hundred times. <laughs> it just doesn't save any of your data, right? Uh, and and same same thing with the parent teacher. You can do as many of them you want. It just doesn't save your data. And then the data dashboard version is there. And if you want that, you're going to have to work through us to set up a contract. All right. So when you finish, you're going to get. And this my slides don't have all. There's actually more information. You're going to get a breakdown of of uh, scores in a particular, each of the three areas, volitional action, agentic action, action control beliefs. And then also you get a breakdown uh, uh, and on uh, components around uh, uh, initiation of action, self-direction. Uh, you know, you can take it down to a finer grain so you can look at where students have strengths and where they have instructional needs. Now, the easiest way to save this document is to um, print up here. If you print, it'll bring up the option. Of course, you can always print it out if you're at a printer, but a lot of times you aren't. You can, you can print to PDF, right? And that saves it as a PDF so you have the document, okay? Because once you hit finish, you're out of there. You're gone. Now, also included... Um, so overall self-determination 
average scores of items within each essential characteristic, in-text definitions. We also have a, a uh, user's guide to, to uh, talk about what each of these areas, what kinds of skills to work on. That's also loaded in your wiki uh, already, so it's there. Um, uh, and then print, print to PDF or printer friendly. And if you're using the one-time use, once you finish and leave the website, it's gone. Uh, we have a parent teacher, we have a, a, a guides to each of the, the, the student report and the parent teacher report. Um, I've uploaded them on the wiki, but they're also available on the website, uh, selfdetermination.org, that, that talk about what are these essential characteristics. So you get information about autonomy, self-initiation, pathways thinking, self-direction, Etc. You get some ideas. You know what we we want to do is we want to continue to build this out. So one of the things that we are just about done with is a an American Sign Language version of it. So in addition to uh, clicking on uh, a uh, play button to uh, play the uh, to read the item aloud, uh, you'll be able to click on a um, a video that then has uh, somebody sign uh, the uh, uh, item. So that's almost done, and we've been working with uh, uh, some folks in Texas to, to get that version. Uh, we have a Spanish version. Um, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's Spanish Spanish, so a Spaniard did the translation, and I understand there are differences between Mexican Spanish and, and other forms of Spanish, but in general, I think that the version, we want to extend to more language options. Um, it takes uh, more money than it should to do each language option set up, so it's not just, uh, we're not just able to load something up. As I said, we want to we want to include, at some point, ways of assessing self-determination for young people for whom self-report measures aren't viable. And the other thing we want to do is that we want to build expert capacity into the system so that at the end, instead of just getting this report that says here are areas of strengths and here's where some instructional areas might be, you, you also get, and here are some lessons and some ways that you can teach. How do you teach self-initiation, right? So here are some ideas about things you can do. So as a teacher or a parent or somebody, you can take that information and run with it without having to go figure it out yourself. So that's, those are things that we're wanting to do as we continue to build out the system. But the, the student report and the parent-teacher report are online right now. The Spanish version is online right now. Uh, and uh, we'll just continue to uh, 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 upgrade that. Um, there are, if you go to the Zero Center website, there is at least one other assessment. The, AIR, self-determination scale. Uh, the American Institutes for Research is what AIR is an acronym for. And um, we, uh, and it's a, a measure, it, it actually gives you a little different information from the ARC scale in that the ARC uh, scale and the, the self-determination inventories are, are snapshots of, of current self-determination. But they don't really tell you uh, why somebody is is or is not self-determined at that point. The AIR gives you scores around opportunity uh, to, to self-determine and capacity to self-determine. So you get information on, um, it may be that folks just don't have the opportunity to express preferences and set goals and things like that. Or it may be that they have don't have the skills necessary. So you get a little different information. And the AIR scale also has a, a parent report, a teacher report, and a student report version. So that's available online on the Zero Center website uh, for free. Um, so student involvement in educational and transition planning um, is, as I mentioned, we, we have good evidence that students uh, can become more self-determined if they're actively involved in their uh, educational uh, programs uh, and planning. Um, there are lots of benefits to that. I'm going to go through two versions, two different processes 
uh, that have good good evidence of their efficacy. I do want to make a, a comment though, and um, the the speaker um, um, right before you went to lunch mentioned the I'm determined uh, process. This is something that the state of Virginia uh, set up, and they've got I've got the website for you as as a last slide. Uh, but if you go to I'm Determined Virginia, you'll come to their website. They have a process for uh, students uh, becoming involved in their IEP. They've got uh, uh, materials for promoting self-determination. Uh, they haven't been subjected to rigorous evaluation, so you can't call them evidence-based practices. But quite honestly, I think there's every reason to believe that that those sets of materials can achieve the same kinds of things that we know that these processes do. So, um, you know, you know, I, when we're talking about student involvement, um, I have seen schools that simply have built a student involvement process around students presenting PowerPoints about what they do well, what they like, what they've learned, uh, what their goals could be. I think there are lots of ways to get to this. My, uh, when we moved to uh, Overland Park, Kansas, uh, Overland Park is on the Kansas side of the Kansas City metro area. Uh, the district that my, my, my youngest son was uh, about to enter kindergarten and my oldest son was about to enter third grade. And they had a district-wide practice where for all students, this wasn't a special ed thing, it wasn't related to the IEP, every student the second parent-teacher meeting of the year was student-led. So that was in the spring. And so we got there, and we didn't know anything about this, and, and uh, I thought it was great. And, and so uh, my younger son, they didn't start it until first grade, so my kindergartner, he saw his older brother get ready and run the meeting and all this stuff. Well, um, when he hit first grade was when they started this. So we weren't thinking too much about it. We got a couple weeks right before the uh, parent-teacher meeting, and he began talking about this thing, and he would begin talking about And all they did was they had a two-page two sheet, you could do it front and back, uh, where it said, uh, this year in math, I worked on, and then some short description of what they worked on, I was really good at describing what they were really good at, and then they would bring along a portfolio to show what they were good at. And I need a little more work at, and then they could identify uh, areas where they need love. This was nothing, this was, you know, you could do this in half an hour easily, and yet the night before his student-led parent-teacher meeting, my, uh, my son, the younger one, could not sleep. I thought we would, A, we, we thought we'd never get him to shut up, and B, uh, get him to say he was so excited. I just thought, you know, gosh, if we just did this for every kid, we would never fight the battles we do with IEPs. If we made IEPs about things that talked about student strengths and, and uh, students, you know, uh, were actively engaged in them. You know, I think the drawback to the student-led IEP kind of things is that they are linked to the IEP. And IEPs can be contentious kinds of environments, right? So, but, you know, as long as there's IEPs, we need to have students uh, in actively engaged. So my point is there's lots of ways to do this that don't involve these programs. Both of these are free, available, take them, Use them in whatever ways uh, fit for you. So uh, I'm going to talk first about something that we created called Whose Future Is It Anyway? Uh, the most recent version we redid after IDEA 2004 uh, so that it was uh, more current. Um, then uh, Attainment uh, Corporation were looking for evidence-based practices that they could uh, create commercially available, and they were able to create it's not a fully universally designed version, but it's it's a much more universally designed. It's computer based. I'll show it to you a little bit. So they're they're the same program. The whose future is it anyway is available free on the Zero Center website in PDF. So you you know it's it's we we uh, contract in co our contract with Attainment made it clear that we were going to continue to distribute whose future free because we wanted people to have access to it. We've had. We've had teachers use it individually. We've had districts adopt it. We've had 
parents use it to begin to think about transition planning. So the idea is that it's a student-directed transition planning process. Uh, and the difference, uh, one of the difference that uh, whose future has is that the student is the end user. So everything in it is written for the student. So the student is the audience. Now, the teacher, the parent, whomever, has to support, has to facilitate, has to make sure that the student is involved. We have good evidence. We've done a large randomized trial. We know that students who are involved in whose future is it anyway uh, uh, results in uh, significantly higher levels of self-determination and transition knowledge and skills, as well as self-efficacy for transition planning uh, and, and other uh, positive benefits. So we, we have really good evidence of the impact of whose future is it anyway. So as I said, the primary audience is our students. Um, and so it's all written at, at a level that's understandable and hopefully humorous. I don't know, you know, humor changes and it, it hadn't been updated from 2004 and who knows whether it's considered humorous anymore. But, you know, it's, it's, it's written to engage students. Uh, the student, uh, we, we talk about student directed in that students retain sort of control of the process. But... Uh, facilitators do whatever it takes for students to participate. We've had teachers uh, audio record the whole thing. We've had them, uh, you know, uh, use uh, 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 manipulatables to try to uh, uh, gain, uh, you know, uh, get information across. Just whatever it takes. Um, so we're not, you know, we're not suggesting that students should run their own IEP. We want students involved and to make a meaningful decision about what they they want to uh, 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 to do in their IEP. Some students just don't want to be running it. Now, you know, we'll talk about the self-directed IEP, which is teaching students to run it, and that's great. Lots of good stuff there. So, uh, but I, what we wanted to do was make it such that students had a meaningful voice in how they participate. There is one sort of, it's not written in as a must do, because that would be counter, but uh, and all students leave the process with a goal they have written to have included on their IEP. So at the very minimum, students will have a goal they have written around something they care about that can be included on the IEP. Um, so um, um, we, we want to enable students to, to play a meaningful role, to self-monitor, self-instruct, uh, to evaluate, uh, there, uh, we wrote it, there are 36 sessions, about an hour per session. The general idea was that you could start at the, when, when, when the IEP ended and, and within a, by, the, by the next IEP, you would have students ready to participate in a meaningful way in their IEP. But people use it all sorts of different ways. Sometimes they just crunch it in a, in a month and they get it done. And, you know, so it's really up to you what works. Uh, for the, the time. It's written at a fourth grade reading level to try or below to try to keep, uh, keep it manageable for students. Uh, there's a coach's guide for the facilitator, the teacher, or the parent, or the uh, support provider. The, the main areas, the first one is called getting to know you. So it's, it's about self-awareness and disability awareness. And we really emphasize we, you know, I, I'm leery of disability awareness because oftentimes that comes off as you should just accept the fact that you have this diagnostic label, right? That's not where we want to go. What we want to do is to get students to understand that they have a unique set of strengths and areas of, of support need and that, uh, that, uh, that they're better off knowing what they, how they best learn and and how, what kinds of supports they need so that they can have those kinds of things put into place. So we have a, an acronym for, a, we call it MULES, My Unique Learning Educational Supports. Students learn about what they do well, what they do. They learn about the transition planning process. They identify, based on federal law, who should be at these things. Uh, they're given opportunities to suggest people that uh, could come. They, uh, they get, uh, we ask that they get if necessary, redacted versions of their last IEP meeting so they can look at their goals. 
so they have an idea of what their goals are and, and begin to think about uh, whether they have been making progress on those goals and, 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 and what kinds of goals they would like. So that's, that's the first section uh, with 36 sessions and, and six uh, primary content areas. Uh, you, know, you get the, the, the fact that there are six lessons in each, uh, each of these uh, content areas. Making decisions, so we, we, uh, introduce, we introduce some basic uh, transition areas for outcomes, post-secondary education, um, uh, employment, um, independent living, uh, rec leisure kinds of things. And then we begin to, to teach a very simple decision-making process, do it, where uh, the, D, the D stands for determine your options, the O stands for something, I can't remember it anymore. But uh, So you're, you're working with students to begin to learn to make decisions about these broad areas of transition that they will, they will you know, need uh, some uh, instructional focus on over time. Then we, uh, how to get what you need section 101 is a section that looks at, um, you know, help students understand where they can find supports, what kind of resources are out there, instead of waiting on somebody else. We once did a survey of self-advocates, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and said, and this was a group, 80% were employed, so it was, it was really a, a quite a, an accomplished group uh, in terms of obtaining employment. We asked them uh, whether they were satisfied with their job, and 95% said yes. But the problem is if you ask people they're satisfied, generally they'll say yes. <laughs> uh, we asked them, we said, is this the job that you would have if you could have any job? And uh, only about 30% said yes. So 70% of those people that were employed, it wasn't their, their ideal job, if you will. And then we said, what are you waiting for to get that ideal job? And they were waiting on VR to find them that job. They were waiting on somebody else. So we want to we want to uh, give them the the mindset that they can go out. You know, it doesn't have to be your parent contacting VR. You can contact VR. Um, so resources and how to get what you want. Uh, we teach some uh, in the next section goals, objectives in the future. We begin setting goals around some of the areas that were discussed in the in, the, uh, in that the post post secondary outcome, the transition outcomes. We go through a, a section on communication, particularly focused on small group communi communication. We talk about being assertive versus being aggressive. We talk about body language. We talk about uh, listening, active listening, how to get, you know, how to get what you want in the context of a group of people, some of whom have different opinions, right? And then the final section is kind of leadership uh, skills and, um, and then students uh, go through a review and figure out what they want, to, what kind of role they want to take in their IEP. Okay, so that's it. Um, uh, again, we've used it lots of Lots of times, the original version was 95. We, uh, we upped it once uh, IDEA was reauthorized. Uh, we know it works. We know that students benefit and gain these things. The, if you have a little money, uh, uh, you can buy, I think they sell them in classroom packets. Um, it's not much, it's under 500 bucks for everything. But it's the, the whose future is it. I don't know, they dropped anyway. They didn't like anyway. They just dropped it to whose future is it. And uh, so this is shorter. There's 15 chapters in three sections, getting to know your IEP decisions and goals, your IEP meeting. They took the content from uh, the whose future is it anyway. They created a really colorful, and I think they've done a, a nice job. There's a student reader, there's a student workbook, and there's an instructor's guide. The student reader is also on a CD-ROM that uh, plays and, and is the universally designed version. So uh, here's an example. So here's the, here's the workbook version of it uh, on a section on making decisions. Here's what the, um, the CD-ROM version looks like. You get a, you know, it, it's like a book, but it flips pages. You can, you can highlight text for text to speech. Um, you can have it read at lower rates. Uh, you can change font size. So there's quite a few universal design features that make it uh, easier for students to, to do it more uh, autonomously. Um, 
the instructor's guide is a, it comes along. Um, there's a workbook. We've been trying to get the the kind of the all the work activities, uh, and all of these are sort of fun. They're not the kind of standard uh, uh, complete this worksheet and turn it in kind of thing. Uh, but we we haven't been able to get it to where it's uh, easily online, so it remains mainly in a in a in the uh, uh, print version. Um, there's accommodation ideas in the in the instructor's guide. Again, CD printable and electronic materials. You purchase it, but if you need more, you can print them out. So, um, so anyway, so that's that's the uh, uh, whose future is it? Um, I've mentioned the self-directed IEP. This is this is developed by Jim Martin and his colleagues at the time he was at Colorado University of Colorado. Uh, he's now just recently retired from Oklahoma University. So these are all available online at the Zero Center website. Uh, the self-directed IEP was the first of these student-directed IEP kind of programs that came out. I know it's made its round through Florida at least some point in time. Some of you may have seen it. Um, I think they do a good job. It's it's uh, uh, there are it's part of the Choice Maker series. So uh, it's uh, there are. Um, uh, a section on taking action and setting goals and something else. So the, the whole packet is available, but the self-directed IEP is the student involvement thing. You've got videos that are available, uh, a teacher's manual and a student workbook. They're all available, as I said, online. Um, again, there's uh, good uh, evidence uh, of the positive impact of this, uh, of student involvement in this on self-determination, so students who are involved in this SDIEP uh, become more self-determined. Uh, there's also, they, they uh, have collected data and, and evaluated the impact on student behavior during an IEP meeting in uh, when students have been uh, uh, instructed using the self-directed IEP. Uh, teachers talk less and Parents and students talk more, so it sort of balances. And I, I don't know about you, but as a teacher and in other roles, I often find myself having to try to prompt people. You know, you talk more because you have to, because nobody else will say anything. But I think it's because, you know, when you have a student running their IEP meeting, it, it changes the climate. It changes how that looks like. I think when you do this, you, be, you begin to create allyships not only with the student but with parents and families because you know I think fundamentally parents and families want what's best for their son or daughter and if they see you showing respect and saying I believe you can do this then that that tells the that creates I think a positive uh, relationship between parents and students as well the SDIEP has a series of um, of uh, instructional materials that uh, teach students 11 steps in running their IEP meeting. Uh, so introduce, stating the purpose, introducing everyone, reviewing past goals and performance, ask for others' feedback, state your school and transition goals, ask questions, deal with differences of opinion, state what support you will need, summarize your goals, close the meeting by thanking everyone, and work on IEP goals all year. So uh, these are uh, you know pretty simple. It's not like they're having to complete the complex uh, document that has to be signed by everyone. These are, you know, and it, and they have videos. They're sort of uh, uh, amateurish looking videos, but they're videos of a student using all these steps. And I just think, you know, I can remember when I first saw uh, this, I thought, what a great idea. It's putting students in a central uh, point and, and, and uh, you know, it just, again, changes the dynamic of that. So that's, that's the SDIEP. There, these are available uh, uh, for free the, um, on the Zero Center website. Uh, we also have a, a site called the uh, National Gateway to Self-Determination that has most of these materials as well, uh, ngsd.org. Uh, we have one of the nice things about the NGSD, if you, if you do any training for your district, um, we have more than 50 videos of people with disabilities talking about why self-determination is important to them in employment or in school or in whatever topic you're interested in. 
there would be a video or two. So it's it's the voice of self-advocates talking about these things. We have a couple of videos that are, in fact, introductions to self-determination and uh, that uh, have people with disabilities talking about it. So there's there's resources at both of these. Whose future is available at both of those sites? The, the self-directed IEP is available from the, the Zero Center. Okay, so... Um, So let's let's um, let's take a break. How about a break? You want a break now? Or you want a break in fifteen minutes? You're speaking with your feet. Let's let's break. Come back by two fifteen if you would. So take ten minutes, and uh, we can launch through uh, how we infuse instruction into that, and then talk about the self-determined learning okay. model instruction. How's that? And remember. This slide, once you get into the wiki, you can just find this website from there. But yeah, I wish they'd made that one easier, but they don't. You can also, if you also just Google uh, uh, Zero Center Self Determination, it gets you there too. Huh? Yeah. Some sort of like a, a counselor for other kids. Uh-huh. Because he's so compassionate and so interested in everything. How old is he? Like I didn't I'm 16. 16, yeah. He, he would do so well in some sort of public service. Right. He's like a junior life coach. Right. So I don't know what to do. You know, I think uh, you know, algebra seems to be the gate, gateway to everything, which is why the mentality is we need to take algebra. I'm not sure. I think that's really 21st century learning uh, 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 philosophy. You know, the positive benefits are, are he's, he's in a class that every student is in, but obviously if he doesn't have the, the requisite sort of skills, it's going to be difficult, and he's not going to be successful without a lot of support. So, you know, I don't know that, you know, this is, this is something the family wants, wants to do. Is that the big impetus or the, the, the school wants to do or, yeah, yeah, you know, I think there's only so much you can do at certain, I mean, I, you know, I'm a strong believer that we, we begin to work with students uh, as they get, so you get into the older ages, you get into high school, the content matter in some areas become so complex that you know i mean I, I i firmly believe that third and fourth graders we can we can fully integrate and we can we can include kids in that and in content but when you get up into high school and you're talking about trig or even algebra there are content issues that you have to have so you know i i know you know it sounds like you have a sense already of what uh, he, he prefers. I, I was. I'm thinking about a, a young woman in Massachusetts that we worked with her and her family, and she, um, she actually uh, was fascinated with Rome, ancient Rome and Greece, and so wanted to take Latin, and that was a good fit with her, um, with her interest. And the teacher was willing to uh, modify the course, uh, the you know the grading and other things that. Uh, uh, so that she was able to be successful, and she was. Now, it gets harder with math-related content. I mean, it's, it's harder to modify that. So, 
you know, I think all you can do is is talk with uh, the student about what it is they like about this. What are they, you know, what are they, what do they want to achieve? How that how how that does or does not help them get where they want. Um, you know, at some level, sometimes you got to fail and then learn from failure. So I think maybe the very least being there as the kid is struggling to provide support and say, you know, this, everyone struggles and, and, uh, you know, let's think about what you're learning out of this experience. So, um, you know, I, and I think if he had been started in math early on and this was something that, you know, was in his wheelhouse, it'd be one thing, but. Well, yeah. he used to be able to like contract using his finger. Mm -hmm. Now he gets stuck. Mm -hmm. And well, and you know, I mean, there there really is no reason not to use calculators and things like that. But I'm just not sure algebra is um, algebra is you know sort of word problems and these a plus x equals y and there's you know that's not so much <laughs> calculator as it is understanding fairly complex. You know, if you've got a really good teacher in there, you can create you know you can create taxonomies of learning so that you expect different learning out of different students. I could see where you could design a, a, a successful experience where you're taking into account what the student is doing, uh, you know, what you're expecting the student to learn, uh, you know, adjust it, but the students still be involved. Now, you know, that I think you could do. Whether it had value or not, one of the values would be just being in there with their peers. But it takes a, a teacher that's committed to doing that. And often general educators don't have that skill set and special educators don't have the time or whatever else. So I wish there was an easy answer. There probably isn't. So, you know, staying staying with them and keeping them, uh, trying to support them in whatever way possible and, you know, help keeping turning it from a... a you know, the, the problem with failure experiences is if they stay failure experiences, right? So, you know, we all, we all sometimes get in over our head and, and, but it, we learn something and, and change something about it. So that, that's probably a role you'll want to play. So, sorry not to have a better answer. Oh, did you? So that would be where? Oh, Kirksville, yeah. So it's now Truman State, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good. That's a pretty part of the country. My uh, uh, my folks are both from Boonville and um, uh, New Franklin, right across the river from Boonville. So mid Missouri, right by uh, uh, right by Columbia. So I know that part of the country pretty well, and it's pretty. And I I know several people have gone to Truman and have been really happy with it. So. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, you couldn't. Oh. Yeah. Be safe, the movie. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's what uh, right. Jack was talking about. What time do you want me to close down? Um, You've got, um, you're going to do a. Yeah, we're going to do um, the drawing. Uh -huh. um, and then I want to, I want to, before you leave, I want to get a picture of our staff. Okay. And I wanted to introduce our staff. Okay. So, so that'll be you know, five minutes. So whatever time ten, you want. 10 till you... four? Sure. Sure. Does that great. give you enough time? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. You know, I knew I, um, when I had done some online research over the years, uh, I saw that Kings Future, and it was, when I saw your name, I recognized your name, and then I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's been around a while, but we couldn't get anyone to actually sell it, so we gave it away. <laughs>
Okay. Let's plunge ahead. Uh, just by way of reminder, so I got an email asking requests for somebody who wanted access to the PB Works website. That means that there was a, a you, you, somebody selected log in. You don't want to log in. You don't have to. I don't know if anyone here, I'm not asking for true confessions. You just go to this website. So you go to the website. And uh, well, let me open it up here. Yeah. Oh, one. So once again, you go here and, and you don't have to log in. Uh, you just go to Pages and Files. And all this stuff is, is available to you. And if you want to download something, I didn't show this, to download something, say you want to, you can, you can click on it and it'll open it up. Um, well, here, the easier way to do this is for each one, it'll, it'll bring up a dialog box there on the right. It says more. So you can download it, and that brings it up as a PDF um, that you open, you can look at. So this is, that's good, this is a really neat piece that the National Learning Disability Council did on personalized learning and uh, self-determination. So, and then you can just save it as a PDF uh, to your hard drive. So all of that is accessible without having to, um, to log in. Um, then I wanted to show you, uh-oh. <laughs> All right, hang on here. Oh yeah, this is right. I wanted to show you what the National Gateway to Self-Determination website looks like which was right there, okay. So um, one of the things we tried to do, and we, we developed this as part of a federally funded project. Um, one of the, I mentioned it's got lots of uh, videos and you can, you can follow um, uh, the um, guide, the, the products page. You can, down here you can go to videos and you can see you can then search videos by type of content. So all these videos are things that talk about, have young people with disabilities talking about these things. But we created uh, separate areas, if you will, for families and parents. So families, there's uh, information and content related to things that will be pertinent to parents and family members. For people with disabilities themselves, uh, as a resource for them to gain more information about self-determination and why it's important to them, and then for professionals. A lot of this, one of the differences between this and the zero side is that uh, we were focusing a lot on adults with this, so it's got more material for adults with disabilities as opposed to just uh, uh, students, uh, student age, uh, education-focused stuff. So, so that's the National Gateway. There's just lots of stuff. Uh, that uh, relates to a number of areas. Um, we have uh, PDFs of these research to practice briefs that we developed that I think do a nice job of talking about topics like um, employment or uh, health and, and ways in which self-determination fits into those. So, so that's a resource, ngsd.org. All right. I want, we have a, about an hour and a half before I vacate the stage, and I want to go through uh, uh, how do we promote self-determination uh, sort of on a day-to-day -day basis, and then I want to talk about the self-determined learning model of instruction, which is an, an evidence-based practice that we've developed to promote self-determination. So I've showed you this before. This is the matrix that we use to, to develop assessment interventions. We've got sort of what we call essential characteristics, volitional action, agentic action, action control beliefs, component constructs, things like autonomy, self-initiation, self-regulation, 
these kinds of things. But what really, when it comes to intervention, it's this list of component elements that we're going to talk about now. This is, if you're teaching choice making skills and providing opportunities for choice making and you're teaching decision making and you're teaching goal setting, and you're, you're modeling problem solving and teaching, you're, you're promoting self-determination. You never have to say the word, right? And think about it, we can, we can teach goal setting and and in if whether we're teaching algebra or science or tra doing transition work, right? Uh, the, it, 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 a lot of it is just making things conscious and explicit. Um, so um, I want to go through some um, ideas for how we teach these kinds of component elements so that we have a better understanding of that because I think it's really important that instruction be on these things be infused through throughout the curriculum throughout the students day across age ranges in fact one of the things that was helpful if you will about uh, the the standards based focus was that starting in the late 90s we would go and we would identify the state standards in anything, literacy or math or anything, and look across grade levels, and we would identify places where the state standards talked about problem solving, goal setting, decision making, choice making, and they're in there because those are things that are valued for every student. And then we could come in and say, look, for, these, for a student with a disability, we know how to teach them to set and attain goals and to achieve. So we could begin to link instruction to promote self-determination to, um, to uh, the, the state standards and, and student performance standards. With the Common Core, I haven't done a mapping, but I'm sure that the Common Core talks about problem solving, decision making, goal setting across content areas, across grade levels. So it's a way that we've leveraged it to begin to talk about not only uh, uh, promoting access to the general education curriculum for students with disabilities, because we know how to do this, but also being able to say, look, all kids need to learn how to, to self-regulate problem solving and we can we have this process that we've developed. So um, so that's what we're, you know, I, I think the, at the first level of, of quote intervention is that we're we're teaching these skills preferably to all kids, because it's not just kids with disabilities. Um, so um, when we're looking, when we're looking at the emergence and the development of self-determination over time, it, it does begin very early on. It's it, the uh, parents and families play a huge role. How you know what kind of choices, what kind of uh, how much students or uh, children are involved in decisions in the family, all these things, what you expect. You know, uh, I, uh, for a number of years, I would just ask adults with the, the developmental disabilities who was the most important to them uh, uh, to develop their self determination, and it was almost always parents. <laughs> you know. And so it's expectations that uh, that you have for them. Uh, with it, so um, uh, you know, so whether we're talking about home or whether we're talking about school, we get kind of three things I'm looking for. One is we want to enhance the personal capacity of young people with disabilities to self-determine, uh, and um, you know, uh, so let's take for example. Yeah, some of that is just the the, the attainment of development, developmental mind, milestones. If you can, if you can, uh, uh, when when a when a child begins to speak and use words, it becomes easier for them to manage and regulate their environment. Right? When they begin pointing a little bit before that, they it's better than you know having to crawl over to the place or just yell. You know, so these refinements all make it easier. Now, I say that with somewhat with trepidation because there will be people who will think, well, if you don't talk you know, verbally, then you can't be self-determined. Well, that's just completely nonsense, right? We can work with, and, and the, the overlap I've had with speech and language hearing folks over the years, and I about once every 10 years, I end up presenting at ASHA, the uh, American Speech and Hearing Association, 
um, because somebody who works in the area of augmentative and alternative communication thinks it's really important to, in, in, you know, to promote self-determination using AAC types of device. So you know, if students don't speak uh, or don't speak well, then we have, to, we have to pay more attention, we have to listen to them, we have to get to know them, understand better what they like and don't like and what they're saying, and we need to provide whatever way we can provide for them to communicate uh, more. So, uh, but anyway, there's, you know, sort of the attel attainment of developmental milestones, and then there's, there's the acquisition of these skills related to these component elements that we'll talk about. But also opportunity, you know, you, you can have all the skills in the world, but if you never get a chance to use them, it doesn't matter, does it? I mean, you can know how to make a decision, but then never be allowed to make a decision, and it's a moot point. So opportunity is oftentimes as or more important. I, you know, my experience is, in, in most cases, just enabling students, putting them in situations where they're enabled to make choices and to uh, to meaningful participate is as good a way to start as teaching them some prerequisite set of skills. Now, you know, there are things that you want to be teaching students and, and uh, but nevertheless, opportunity, we want to build environments that, that support uh, choice and autonomy. And we talked about what those look like earlier. We want, particularly for younger kids, frequent experiences of choice and control. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So, and then the supports and accommodations that enable them to be successful. And again, technology is going to play a, a big role in that. There's lots of, of ways that we can figure out uh, how to support people. So, uh, so in terms of sort of focus, again, I think uh, instruction on these component elements of self-determined behavior uh, across content area across the school day and across a child's career. We ought to be teaching goal setting, problem solving, decision making, choice, we ought to be infusing choice in, all these things. It's, you know, it, it just, we can do it, we can, we can, uh, you know, it doesn't take a lot of energy, it doesn't take a lot of time, it mainly is just being aware of that. And then there are some specific curricular materials uh, and assessment materials that assist that and then Student involvement is sort of the third thing. So when I'm in a school and I'm looking at the degree to which they're promoting self-determination, I'm sort of looking for some combination of these things. And, and that's what I think we want to be doing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, because I was, uh, I, I was asked to talk a little bit about kind of early childhood and younger kids and the development of self-determination. So, you know, um, young people, very young children, uh, aren't self-determined as we understand it. You know, they're dependent upon others in their lives, adults to structure their days and to uh, support them. Really, I think we we look at the development of self-determination as emerging in, uh, you know, kind of late middle and into into high school. It varies for some kids, but but there's lots of things that have to happen both before kids hit school and later on in life or later on in or elementary school, uh, and um, that lead to the future development of self-regulation and, and some of the things we'll be talking about. This, I don't know that this is really a very helpful. This is just simply, uh, it's uh, uh, the Bronfenbrenner's uh, ecological system. So we're impacted in what we do by the microsystem, which is the the things that are around us, so in this case, the microsystem is neighborhood and place of worship and family and school and peers. So those, the microsystem is one level where uh, our behavior is impacted. And obviously, uh, you know, peers and same age peers and, and working within the context of the microsystem is an important element. Families are critically important in the development. And then you've got mesosystem levels that include um, the, uh, uh, well, meso is sort of the next level up. I don't know why I didn't put anything in there. They're, they're sort of, uh, uh, school districts are meso systems. They're, they're not the direct uh, family, but they're a little, little larger. And then you get out to what they call the exosystem and the macro system. This is service systems. 
and then finally economic and legal and all these things. All of these things impact relative self-determination over time. So, you know, when we're looking with younger kids, what we have to be looking at is how can we support the family to enable young people to become more self-determined? Now, they're not going to be self-determined as we know it when they're five, six, seven years old. But, you know, and, and so we talk a lot about uh, choice as being when children are young, choosing, being able, being supported to make a choice enables them to begin to learn that they can control their environment and it's sort of precursors to later self-regulation kinds of things. So um, I've got a, uh, there's a paper, there's a couple papers that uh, are uh, in the wiki on this, um, but just, you know, there's, we can look at things like overarching sense of self-awareness and self-knowledge. Uh, there are some things that we can focus on in the early years, early childhood, two to five years, uh, that would be important for the later development of self-awareness and identity and self-knowledge. Then as they get a little older, there's things that can be done uh, and into late elementary. I'll talk a little bit about how these vary as we go through these component elements. I'm just giving you illustrations, um, uh, you know, uh, helping young people, what they're called domain and mean specific beliefs. These are the beliefs that you can solve problems and that uh, means end problem solving is that you are able to identify the means that lead to you. So there's, there's things we can, oops, I hit too many. Uh, uh, choice making, problem solving, decision making. Let me just give an illustration here about how these this these are a good one to be uh, to understand more of a developmental perspective on. So we often use kind of choice making and and problem solving, decision making, uh, sort of interchangeably sometimes, particularly problem solving and decision making. But as I'll define in a minute, they're 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 different and distinct activities. Um, very very young infants as young as two weeks of age, which is about the earliest you can measure anything in infants, because up until two weeks of age, they're just asleep. If they're not asleep, they've got bowel movements going on, or they're eating, or they're screaming. So it's really very difficult to do research. But once you get about two, two weeks of age, you know, there, there's ways of measuring. So what uh, it's been, you know, a long time ago now, it's not even a new finding, that we, we, we know that Infants two weeks of age have a preference for ovals over triangles. Isn't that weird? Now, why would that be? That's exactly right. Mom's face is an oval. And as a species, if we come hardwired with preferences for ovals, it means we're going to seek out food sources, right? That's pretty clever. There's lots of things that, in fact, we come into this world with preferences for. Uh, some seem really odd, but most of them are kind of species driven and evolved over time. Now then, if you've been around a six month old later, uh, lately, you'll know that they will have developed all sorts of preferences that go way beyond whatever they had with them when they came in. I mean, they are, you know, they know what they want, they know what they like, and then when they, uh, when they begin to, uh, crawl, you know, you got to move everything in your house up to about six feet so they can't get into them. You got to put things in all the sockets, you know, and then when they can point and then when they develop language, they become more sophisticated about this. So, you know, we really don't have to teach choice making as much as we have to structure environments. And so very early, I mean, between two and two and five, uh, uh, working with young people to, to, uh, give them choices to express preferences and to act on those preferences has a number of things. As I've said, it's a, a later precursor to both problem solving and decision making skills. It's a, a precursor to self-regulation kinds of skills. You got to learn what is available to you in life and what isn't. <laughs> so one of the things by making, by emphasizing choice is kids learn that there are some options that are not on the table and others that are. So there's lots of things. Now, you know, by the time uh, kids get to high school, we're not really focusing on choice making much because it's just part of their environment. How many choices do typical, uh, typically developing uh, high school students make over the course of a year at school. I mean, 
thousands and thousands, right? I mean, when my, my sons were uh, at that age, uh, you know, we didn't ever sit down with them and say, okay, well, you should take this, this, and this. They came home and they said, well, I'm taking this. And, you know, they would be gone for days at a time. We didn't see them. They, they you know, they chose what they ate. They chose how they spend their time. I mean, you know, just all sorts of things. So choice making is something that becomes really important to focus on in those early years, up until about third grade developmentally. What happens in about third grade is, first of all, kids have learned all they're going to learn about choice making. And you can begin to, because they don't really recognize problems as such. A five-year-old or a four-year-old, they'll run into what you and I would call a barrier or a problem. And instead of stopping and saying, hmm, what can I do to, uh, to, to move this and to change this? They just go do something else. They redirect on their own, right? They just developmentally, cognitively, very young children are not, re not ready to solve problems. But by the time they get to third grade, they begin to have the, the developmental skills that enable them to begin to sit down and to begin to think about problem solving. And we'll, I'll, I'll talk about the kind of stages of teaching that. And then uh, by about uh, eighth or ninth grade, uh, 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 children uh, who, who are provided opportunities to learn these things have acquired, you know, reasonable sophistication in this. And then you begin to focus on decision making because what is a decision? It starts with a problem to solve. The problem is what are my options? And it ends with making a choice. So it so there's there's really a nice kind of lifespan uh, trajectory there. So you're looking, you you know, and you know, I honestly believe that, you know, we did research 25 years ago showing that young people with intellectual disability uh, were able to generate fewer and less sophisticated options for problems to solve. Now, is that because they are unable to do so? Or is it because nobody ever provided opportunities to do so? I'm, a str I'm strongly on the opportunity side. I think it's all about having chances to solve problems and to learn a thinking in a problem-solving stage and that, that young people can, in fact, uh, on the spectrum, young people uh, with cognitive disabilities can learn to be sophisticated problem solvers, not just now. Does that mean they're going to solve the most complex problem in the world? No, but neither am I. <laughs> I'm also going to, you know, I'm going to refer to experts who, who know something about, you know, the medical condition to find out what, you know, what solutions are best. So, uh, so I think, uh, and there's, there's good evidence in the literature. Um, the, the, the folks that I've admired the most for a long time is a group out of uh, Teachers College in uh, Columbia University in New York City. Um, they were finding uh, the, that uh, particularly uh, women in the New York City uh, sort of DD support system. Now, obviously, that's a huge city, so it's a huge support system. They run group homes. They have all sorts of things. They were finding that women were at much higher risk for abuse, neglect, uh, domestic violence, those kinds of things, in part because of the context uh, and in part because nobody had really ever talked to them. So I, I don't know whether at the, the session yesterday, whether Kim talked about these kinds of things, but, uh, but so the, the researchers and, the, and the, the service provider got together and they, they began to develop something. They, they, it's called Escape DD. If you Google Escape DD, it's a fully formed intervention to promote uh, problem solving and decision making uh, for, uh, to help people understand better uh, what constitutes a risk situation or not and how to basically problem solve uh, to, uh, to know not to uh, you know, put, a, put yourself in a certain circumstance or whatever else. Um, and and they they broaden this to all young people with DD. I think I would think you know I don't know that they've. I'm I'm sure there have been young people with autism involved in this, and uh, they've shown clearly that given kind of ongoing instruction and they use uh, sort of uh, scenarios, you know, a, a case based kind of learning, that these young people can acquire lots of skills around uh, problem solving and decision making as it pertains to these uh, 
uh, high risk situation. You know, it's it's not only true uh, in uh, in uh, for kids with disabilities. So in in our in our country, we have some really visible. Uh, drug, alcohol, and tobacco awareness programs that are implemented in elementary schools. Uh, Just Say No and Dare are probably the two most visible ones. <clears throat> These are really effective at raising awareness. Uh, and I, <clears throat> I don't think you can find a third grader in this country that will say that they will ever use drugs, drink, or use, uh, or use tobacco. And and do you know what the the actual impact on that on uh, rates of uh, drug, alcohol, and tobacco use in adolescence is? Almost none. Almost none. It's great. That's not being critical of it, but you got to follow it up. And when you follow it up, the the interventions, and this is for all kids, not just kids with disabilities, the interventions that have uh, proven evidence of their impact on reducing risky behaviors on the part of adolescents are uh, interventions that incorporate a problem-solving component within it. So teaching problem-solving is part of what we do. Okay, so, so you know, there's a trajectory. There's things we can work on when they're younger. Again, there's a couple papers up there. Goal setting has the same kind of, you, you know, when, we've, when we work with, we've worked with kindergarten students on, on self-regulated uh, goal setting. We don't expect them to be in, in any way independent in setting a goal. They, they don't, they're not future oriented. They, they don't really understand that, but we can put scaffolding around these things that enable them to understand that. And there's, there's you know, you can, you can engage in play that talks about future lives. So you're looking at future lives, you're looking at, at uh, and then as they get a little bit older, uh, goals, you can begin to set simple goals. So uh, you're, you're, you're uh, praising or reinforcing incremental uh, progress. And then later on, you can begin to focus more on, on teaching goal setting. So uh, these, are, these are things that are important. We've not done as much uh, in the elementary years as we should have, could have. Uh, it's been hard, quite honestly. Almost all of our funding, they were interested in choice as, a, as an intervention. So they chose eating vegetables with uh, elementary age students. Now. I don't know about you, uh, neither of my sons were very keen on most vegetables. Uh, I don't think they were an exception to any rule. I know there were some of their peers that were even less, you know, but kids by and large, you have to cajole them, you have to bribe them, you have to threaten them to get them to eat their vegetables, right? So what this study did was it created three groups. There's elementary school in the elementary school cafeteria. First of all, they did a survey of their of, of, of vegetables ranked from uh, most favored to least favored. And they selected two of them that were right in the middle. So they were neither vegetables that were loved, nor were they vegetables that were hated and despised. And those two happened to be zucchini and green beans. So zucchini and green beans in, in Spain are apparently right in the middle of uh, the preference of uh, elementary age students. And so then they, they uh, 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 randomly assigned the kids in this elementary school to three groups. Group one was a no choice group. And so they went in, somebody randomly gave them either green beans or zucchini. They didn't have any choice. They could come back and eat as much as they wanted though. Uh, so, you, you know, if they finished their green beans or zucchini, they could come back and get more. The second group was the first choice level. That was they could choose between either zucchini or uh, green beans. Um, but, uh, and they, they choose one, but they could only, and they could come back and get more, but it had to be what they'd chosen. So if you, if you chose green beans, you'd come back and get more of it, but it had to be green beans. Then the third group was, you've guessed it already, you can choose and then you can come back and get something different. You can get green beans or zucchini, you can, you can mix and match. So, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the intervention, that was the intervention was the choice. And then they measured uh, in grams uh, vegetables consumed. What are your guess as to which group consumed the most vegetables? Yeah, I would have said group three, two, but actually it was either choice group. It didn't matter. Just introducing choice, and they ate twice as much as the no choice group. 
There was another study that was uh, similar around homework, something that, you know, if you're a secondary educator, you're struggling. We, as parents, struggled getting my younger son to, to turn his homework in. He'd do it, and then he'd, it'd be in his backpack, and, you know, and so, uh, uh, or he didn't do it. <laughs> um, and so uh, the, the study out of a group out of UCLA, um, they, uh, students could choose one of two homework assignments uh, that had the same objective. So the homework targeted the same skill, whatever they were working on. It was just one, they, they could choose one or the other homework assignment. So you had a choice. And then there was the control group that had no choice. They just got the equivalent of what one student got. So there were an equal number of any homework assignment in the control and the treatment group. And what they found after some period of time, I think it was an eight-week period, was that the, the treatment group, the group that had choice, they scored significantly higher, on, they had significantly higher uh, 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 return rates and, and got better grades on homework. And in fact, it then uh, 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 translated into higher scores on the end of the unit test. So, you know, choice is an important uh, and, and potentially powerful intervention for us. And, and so, uh, so anyway, so we're making a choice. Uh, dear, dear Napoleon Bonaparte here said, uh, choice is of, or ability is of little account without opportunity. We just need to structure environments and contexts that enable young people to have choices, particularly younger students, right? Uh, I'm gonna talk throughout this section on what we need to be alert to for students on the spectrum. Um, I don't want this to be interpreted as a deficits thing, but students have different learning uh, uh, profiles and areas that we need to pay attention to. So, students uh, uh, on the spectrum have fewer opportunities to learn about preferences based on personal experiences than their non-disabled peers. One of the things we found is we've done research using the ARC scale uh, with young people, adolescents with autism, is they actually score lower in the autonomy section than either students with intellectual disability or students with learning disabilities. For So, you know, uh, there's probably good reasons. Uh, I mean, we can probably explain that is, but, but you know, if you're not out and about in your community, you, you don't know what you don't know and you don't know what you like, right? I mean, and so we need to, we need to make sure that young people have lots of opportunities to learn about preferences. Uh, students with uh, communication impairments may not be able to express preferences in traditional ways. I've talked about problem behavior as, as an expression of preference. So we need to, to uh, work harder and, and provide them ways of expressing preference and listen better and, and be good uh, observers. Um, you know, I would, I would, I think this uh, this issue of getting young people out, you know, it, often uh, students with disabilities are sort of stuck stuck in time with what people think they like. I, I don't know. I mean, I I can think of a number of young people over time that have some age inappropriate uh, toy or thing, and and the justification for that is that they oh he likes it. Well, he liked it when he was five. But now he's 12, what are, what are, what's happening with his peers that he might like just as well? Or 18 year olds or, you know, and so it's all about experience. It's, it's why I say I wanna hire the person that took Bill in my story earlier, whitewater rafting. You can't know if you like whitewater rafting until you've been whitewater rafting, right? You know, uh, I mean, I think I wouldn't like it, <laughs> but I can't know for sure, you know. So, uh, so having experiences and opportunities. Uh, and then, you know, we have this uh, area for students with, with special interest uh, areas or, uh, uh, you know, areas of, of really intense interest. You know, it's usually framed as a problem, right? Uh, it's inter and it does, in these kind of uh, uh, very targeted interest areas uh, can can disrupt learning in other more developmentally important areas and all these things. We know the the drawbacks of this, but it is it is a, a preference, and you know there is a certain amount of of uh, dignity afforded to recognizing that as a preference and going with it. And so you know it also provides a way for you to. Uh, uh, 
uh, uh, integrate uh, opportunities to make choices around that interest area into almost any activity. So it can be difficult, and I'm not I'm not intending to uh, minimize that. But I think we've got to quit thinking got to quit thinking of it as a problem and start thinking about it as you know there isn't anything a person you you find something that a person with autism has an interest in that isn't also somebody who doesn't have autism's interest, uh, you won't. I mean, it, it's just, it tends to be, and, and it's not even that it's that intent. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm a book collector and I have collected things all my life. So I have, uh, you know, I spend way too much time and money on uh, books that are collectible and I know a lot. I could sit and talk to another collector for, you know, long times. I, I participate in online uh, uh, discussion groups around these topics. It's something that I really enjoy. Um, we all have these things, and or most people do. And, you know, in some cases, if you ever watch American Pickers or some of these HD TV shows, <laughs> there's people that have pretty extreme uh, uh, collections and this and that, you know, as a collector. And, and eBay is the, 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 the documentation of this. There isn't anything in the world that somebody doesn't collect and that somebody's not uh, uh, really uh, crazy about. So... Uh, you know, I think we've got to look at that. How do we do this? I, I, I'm trying to remember Ron Salkind. Is that the, the um, am I right on that name? No, he, uh, his son has autism and the, the, he, he's, he started this affinities program. Uh, his son was really fascinated with Disney movies and it was the way that they, there was a movie made out of, somebody help me here. I'm having a senior moment and not able to, come up with it. Anyone remember? Anyway, it's, you know, I, I recognize it's not perfect, but it, it, it does illustrate. They, you, they then use these Disney dialogues to engage with their son, and he, he went on. He formed an affinity group at the high school around uh, these Disney movies that kids with and without disabilities participated in, and there's a, 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 a segment in the, in the film where uh, these kids with autism are talking, and, and kids with Down syndrome and kids without disabilities, and, and the, uh, I think it's a kid with Down syndrome, talking about these underlying meanings of the Lion King and what it means around relationships and all this thing, and you're thinking, wow, you really did get that out of that, didn't you? So uh, it's just something that we need to be aware of and not just look at it as something that we need to extinguish, right? So... Uh, Choice making, like I said, really important uh, for children, early elementary. Um, we, you know, we've got evidence that simply including a choice option in a behavioral intervention improves the behavioral intervention. So there's there's lots of, of evidence that this is this. You know, I think I think we're hardwired as humans to care about choices, our own preferences. I mean, we do things based upon these preferences that sometimes would seem irrational. I mean, my book collecting behavior seems irrational to my wife, <laughs> you know, uh, but, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, people sort of, uh, we really like to, to uh, make choices. And then the point I made earlier, people's preferences changes just because a student liked it one time doesn't mean that they like it now. So we need to assess, we need to provide lots of opportunities. We can integrate choice into teaching all the time. Student choice is an early step in an instructional process. I've already talked about choice and homework, number of choices related to a given activity, uh, number of domains in which choices are made. Um, you know, uh, giving, giving a kid a choice of when they do something rather than doing it now. You know, it's not that they, ha they can opt out, but and then in some cases, maybe let them opt out of something. So there's lots of ways we can use choice and integrate that into uh, student. All right, so problem solving. A problem is a circumstance, an activity, or task for which we don't know a solution or it's not readily apparent. So we're, we're, we're going about the process of solving this problem, of identifying, technically just identifying what solutions exist for us. If you look at instruction in problem solving, uh, there are three major areas of focus. The first is uh, problem identification. 
The second is problem explication and analysis. And the third is problem resolution. So problem identification. Um, I, I mentioned four-year-olds don't really identify problems, right? So your first step in solving a problem is recognizing that there's a problem. Younger students, early, early students learning, <laughs> learning problem solving processes, they tend to not be really good about uh, uh, identifying uh, what's solvable. You know, I, I use an illustration. Uh, if you're, if you, if you, you, somebody, a bully has stolen your, your textbook. Uh, uh, so there's different levels of problems, but at least one level is, You've got, a, you've got class and you don't have your textbook, right? So, uh, so uh, if you ask, say, a junior high kid uh, what the problem is, they're going to they're gonna say, well, so-and-so is a jerk. <laughs> well, that's probably part of the problem, yeah, but it's probably not very solvable, right? <laughs> Johnny, Johnny's dad was probably a jerk. It's probably genetic, you know. Uh, you know, you, you've got, but, you know, some immediate problems are I need to know whether I need that, uh, textbook for class. So possible solutions are going to the teacher and saying, do I need it this week? If I don't, if I do, uh, I can borrow one. I can do this. Obviously, you're going to want to get uh, resolved around the bullying. But, you know, there's so kids need to learn how to narrow problems down. They they tend to be global, globally attribute to things that are not really solvable. So we need to we, we and we do that by continuing to solve problems and talking through, you know, um, uh, case studies and uh, small group kinds of things are great ways to teach uh, problem solving and, you know, talking through and helping to do that. Problem explication is once, you, once you've uh, identified the problem, then being able to take it to this level of, of analyzing it so that you can solve, uh, uh, solve the problem and then finally identifying possible solutions to the problem. And it just, it just takes practice. It just takes practice. You and I solve problems day in and day out. Um, we do it when we're in the classroom. We've got technology that doesn't work. We have to figure out that problem to solve. We've got, you know, we've got something that didn't go right. You know, some books didn't. We solve problems all the time. We just, we just do it. We don't. We don't do anything outwardly that, that teaches students how we do it. Often, the best way to teach this is to say, oh, I have a problem. My problem is, you know, this, uh, the internet just went down and my lesson was going to have you work on, you know, this uh, website. And so now what can I do? And, you know, it's just about us articulating what it is that we do in solving problems. And then obviously setting students up so that they can, uh, they can try their own problems. We want to, we've got to create environments that um, are safe for students to make mistakes because you, you learn to solve problems by making errors <laughs> and by uh, generating solutions that aren't always perfect. Um, and so we've got to, we've got to create uh, safe spaces. We, we emphasize student capacity to solve problems, uh, create open inquiry and exploration, and then there's lots of things in, in uh, middle and high schoolers' lives that are problems. <laughs> you know, there's relationship problems, and there are, there are problems around whether they're going to drink and, and, you know, do whatever else. And there's all sorts of things that young people, and so we can tie those into things that matter to them and are meaningful to them. Um, so... Uh, when we're thinking about problem solving for students with autism spectrum disorders, so a lot of the problems that we have to solve are interpersonal. That is, they involve relationships with other people. Think about work, you know, the kinds of problems you end up uh, dealing with often is not or with somebody not doing what you want them to do or that you didn't think they would or their, their community. And of course, we know that these kind of social interactions are difficult for young people. Uh, with uh, uh, on the spectrum, and particularly if they if they're emotionally laden, right? So um, you know what we need to do is that we need to uh, practice those kinds of uh, social problem solutions. Uh, you know, I think I think what we're learning is that when we 
when we teach discrete social skills as if those, those things are the outcome we want, students don't become very well socially integrated, right? We've got to focus on social inclusion and social capital and social networking. And, and skills are uh, 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 just contribute to that. So we look at contexts that uh, matter to, to young people and we begin to teach not just social skills, but social skills as part of those contexts so that it matters to, to students. So, um, so, you know, so when we teach problem solving for young people with autism, it ought to probably be in those kinds of social contexts. Uh, unless we do that, then they're not going to be successful. Um, you know, uh, there is evidence that, that adolescents with autism have difficulty in determining social solutions to problems. Again, same kind of issues. But there's also evidence that pr provided the kinds of instruction I'm talking about, that young people can become much better at this, okay? So it's just, it's a matter of paying attention to it. Um, you know, and it's, it is true that when compared to neurotypically developing adolescents, adolescents with particularly, uh, you know, high functioning uh, autism is where the research has been done, generated fewer high quality solutions to social problems and less likely to choose the best solution. Again, I think this is all related to these issues within autism around communication and relationship. And it's just, it's all one package and we just need to understand that when we teach problem solving, we're going to have to integrate it in these contexts of social inclusion, social, social interaction, and, and uh, uh, teach uh, these kind of uh, interpersonal problem solving. Um, decision making. Decision making, uh, there are, if you will, uh, kind of five to six steps. Um, so a decision begins by you identifying the the alternatives that you have from which to make a decision, right? So uh, how many of you watch House Hunters where you have three houses that you have to make a decision about, right? So we spend all, all the series uh, watching these three different options and then they come together and make a decision, right? You know that they've already bought a house. I don't want to ruin that for you, but they've already bought one of those houses. And they go back and they visit other houses that they have no intention of buying. I still think it's a fun thing to watch occasionally. but <laughs> um, So you've got to know your options. And that's a problem-solving process. If you don't know what your options are, then that's the problem to solve. You use problem-solving processes. And then um, with a decision, you want to identify the consequences associated for you with each of these alternatives. It can be, you know, if you're making, I know that uh, uh, if you have a diagnosis of prostate cancer, that certain treatments will have certain after effects in terms of, of uh, 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 incontinence and other things, or and on the other hand, some have a better ratio of success than others. There's all sorts of things that, what are the consequences associated with? Um, you know, if I'm wanting to buy a car and I've, I've, I've got my, I've got the little red convertible or the, the green minivan and I have young children, <laughs> uh, then, uh, you know, the consequences of me, uh, you know, of the, the, of, of the little red convertible might be that, A, I can't get all my kids into this thing. B, they're, they're not going to be safe. Uh, C, you know, the, the consequences is going to cost a lot of money. Insurance is going to run me up. And I'm going to be living on my own because, you know, I should have bought the little, the green minivan, right? But there's consequences. And then, you know, there's a process of consequential thinking where you look at the probability of each consequence occurring. And we, you know, we kind of do kids a disservice. We kind of treat everything as if it, it's 100% guaranteed. <gasps> you spent your lunch money on, you know, I used to say video games, but nobody spends lunch money on video games anymore. They, they carry them with them. You know, you didn't eat lunch. You, you, you spent it on something else that probably doesn't have huge consequences for most kids, right? So, you know, uh, so you're gonna be hungry, you're gonna have to wait. Now, if you have diabetes, it's a different story, isn't it? That, that has a whole different set of consequences. And the consequences, you know, that, you know, in terms of these, 
probability. So uh, uh, let me switch gears. I don't know what the probability of getting lung cancer if you're a smoker is. I know it's not 100% because there are people that live their whole life and don't die of lung cancer, right? Uh, but the, the consequences of lung cancer are really nasty, right? So it's a, it's a case where it may be a relatively low probability, but the, the consequences are so bad. So you're weighing, you're weighing these things about uh, uh, things. And then, then one of the things that comes into play in decision making is you, you, the relative importance or value of things to you, right? And so, you know, you may, you may really, um, well, let's go back to the, the thing. You know, it may just be that it's that time in your life where you've got to have that little red sports car, right? The, the, all, the, all the other things are telling you not to buy that, but presuming you're working with your partner and you're, you're making decisions together, you know. So you're, these importance, these things that are of value to you can override some of these things. So that's, that's part of the reason there's no such thing as a right decision. There's a decision that you've thought through and you've made based upon some of these, these things. Now, in the end, the little red sports car may have been a really bad idea, right? You can't, it's lousy gas mileage. You can't afford the insurance. You're not, you know, you may trade it in and get the mini, minivan anyway, but, you know, that's, you know, that's all hindsight. So then you integrate all these things in and you make it a choice about what you want. So that's, you know, and we can, you know, this is complex, but also I can teach kids elements of every one of these things and they can become more, uh, more involved in decisions. And honestly, think about you as an adult. There aren't many meaningful decisions that you actually make just completely independently, right? You're talking with friends, you're talking with family, you're talking with loved ones, you're talking with people who have expertise. I mean, in a lot of ways, decision making is an interdependent activity in adulthood so that you can get the best information. So, uh, so you know, we can, we, can, we can involve, and let me go back to the discussion about self-determination as making things happen in your life. It's not about doing things independently. My objective is not to make every kid an independent decision maker. It just doesn't matter. But I can, I can involve every student, every young person in some element of these of, uh, problem solving or decision making. And I believe that both they have the right to have that because there's decisions made about their lives that they don't have any voice in. And it enhances the quality of their life when they are involved in these things. And I've been amazed uh, time and time again over the years how, how well students do when provided these opportunities, right? A lot of it is we don't think students will be very successful. Issues in decision making, I think uh, one of the things we've talked to, we've, we've done focus groups with uh, 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 young adults with autism, and one of the things they tell us is that uh, motion uh, the decision making tends to be emotionally laden, and they have a difficult time sort of uh, processing the emotions associated with decision making um, because there's a lot of uncertainty in it. You can you can go through all sorts of processes and come to what you think is your best decision and still have a lot of uncertainty about whether that's the right decision, right? I mean, we've all had that. You come to your best guess, right? And that's just the, the decision-making process is laden with uncertainty. So you're gonna have to work with young people uh, and, and they, that will be difficult for them and help them to begin to understand that, that uncertainty is just part of the process and that they can come back and change decisions and, and they can work that into if they, if they want to minimize uncertainty, that becomes, you know, limits maybe the options or something. So um, goal setting and attainment, um, we, uh, we, we teach goal identification, uh, developing objectives to meet goals, so action planning. Uh, identifying actions and then uh, tracking and following progress on goals. Um, you know, goals, we set goals because they motivate us to work toward them. It's why we set goals at New Year's, whether we keep them or not. You know, there's lots of reasons we don't. But uh, so these are the kind of, of goals that when we focus our attention, 
it motivates us, it, 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 uh, we're likely to act on these. So teaching students how to set goals, uh, you know, there's elements of goals that need to some way be measurable. I'm not talking about the kind of goals we have to write on IEPs. I'm talking about the kind of goals you might set as a, you know, in your personal life. But you still have to be able to, to know whether you're making progress toward your goal. Uh, and, and so, you know, the breaking it down into objectives, identifying an action plan. When am I going to act? If I'm, if I'm wanting to, uh, if, I, if, I, if I'm at risk for, uh, 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 some sort of uh, 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 heart-related disease. Maybe I want to I want to improve my cardio as a way to to uh, improve that. So my goal becomes that. My action plan is to go to the gym once a month. Well, I'm probably not going to make very good progress toward that, right? So I'm going to go back and I'm going to change my action plan, and I'm going to you know, and so, and then tracking. You know, I think that there ought not be a goal on a kid's IEP that they don't have one way to, themselves to track their progress. We know how to do this self-monitoring uh, uh, processes. We ought to students ought to be involved, particularly young young adolescents high school and, and uh, early uh, young adults, that these goals ought to be things that they have some ownership over, they're tracking. One of the reasons that self-monitoring is powerful is because it, it serves sort of the same purpose as goal setting. When you are involved in tracking your progress, you're more likely to continue and to try to make progress. Again, one of the reasons that we don't make progress on our New Year's resolutions is because we don't actually put in place as ways to track this. But when I'm serious about getting to the gym, I'm, I'm setting, you know, I'm, I'm tracking what my uh, blood pressure is each day and I'm looking at things. That motivates me to keep making progress, right? And so that's, uh, that's I think it's really important uh, to, to have young people involved in goals uh, that are part of their uh, IEP. And then of course the educational planning and decision-making process is an ideal circumstance in which to talk about uh, goals. I mean, it's a goal-driven process, right? So we can, and you can teach problem solving and decision making as, as uh, within uh, educational planning. For students with uh, what we've, what we, what we found, and what research has suggested is that that students tend to be more sequential in goal directed. They have a harder time dealing with more than one goal at a time. And the truth of the matter is we're almost always juggling multiple goals. And even, even in a classroom, you know, the same classroom might actually have two or three goals to the thing. So again, I think it's, it's just a matter of practice. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the persistence, I mean, you know, being sequential and goal directed behavior is, is a positive unless it's keeping you from doing anything else, right? So just, you know, begin working, add a second goal, help students to understand that this is just part of the process. Uh, Self-advocacy skills, these are, you know, I mean, if you're gonna be successful with a disability in America today, you better be effective advocate, right? Because you're gonna get messed with at every point in your life. You're gonna go to college, people are gonna make decisions that don't make sense. You've gotta be able to stand up for yourself we can focus on how to advocate. We can teach students what are rights and responsibilities, assertiveness versus aggressiveness. Some of these things I talked about with whose future, negotiation, compromise, effective listening, basic leadership skills. Um, and we can tie it uh, as well to uh, uh, educational planning. Um, I've talked about student-directed uh, learning and, and student-directed learning in our mind uh, we're comparing to this uh, with teacher mediated or student uh, teacher directed or peer directed or technology mediated learning. But these are strategies that teach students to do for themselves what somebody else will be doing to or for them, right? So, uh, and self instruction, antecedent cue regulation, self monitoring, self reinforcement, self evaluation. Antecedent cue regulation is just picture prompting. That's what it is, or audio uh, prompting. But there, we we actually have a lot of evidence of the utility of these kinds of of uh, student directed learning. You, you, they're often talked about as self regulation strategies. I don't know if you've seen the work of like uh, Karen Harris and Steve Graham on the the self regulated. Uh, uh, 
strategy where it's it's writing paragraphs. So, you know, we've got all sorts of evidence that these kinds of strategies are effective with young people. What did I do? Ah. So that ends that. Now let me switch uh, really quick here and we'll wrap up in a half hour. Um, uh, don't save. Um, and talk about the self-determined learning model of instruction. So um, we, when I began this work, we were um, interested in... Um, we got to looking at teaching models, and most teaching models uh, taught teachers how to teach students. And that's where it ended. So it was sort of teacher teaching student. And that's fine, except our interest was in how do we teach teachers to teach students to teach themselves. So we needed to take another step. And, and our, our eventual solution to this is something we called the self-determined learning model of instruction, or the SDLMI. And actually, we have really good evidence of the effectiveness of this. And I will tell you, we've used the SDLMI with teachers working with very young children with, at risk for developmental disabilities, adolescents, in algebra classes, in transition. It doesn't matter. It is a, it's a model that teachers can use to teach students to teach themselves, to, to self-regulate problem solving leading to goal setting and attainment. And it, it, I think it, there's a number of reasons it's powerful, but uh, at least one of them is it involves a process of revising your goal or your action plan so that you can achieve whatever you want to, right? I'll come back to that. Um, and keep in mind, I don't care whether kids are independent at this. It's about making or causing things happen in your life, not about doing things independently. Our experience is that young people can acquire the skills that enable them to do this, but it, you know it will it will vary, and you may have to provide various kinds of support systems. So, what is the SDLMI? As I said, it's a teaching model. Teaching models. The end users of teaching models are teachers. So it's teachers that we're targeting here that enables teachers to teach students to use a problem-solving strategy to basically set, uh, set goals. So uh, we create three phases. The first phase uh, uh, has, uh, each phase has a problem for the student to solve. Uh, the first phase is set a goal. The problem for the student to solve is what is my goal? Problem-solving, self-regulated problem-solving. What is my goal? The second phase, you end the first phase by setting a goal. The second phase is, what is my plan? So that's the problem solved is, what is my plan? You end by creating an action plan and by uh, creating a self-monitoring process to track your progress. And then the third phase is, what have I learned? Or have I learned what I want to learn? And uh, students adjust their goal or their plan as necessary if they're not making adequate progress. Um, you know, uh, teachers often ask, how long does it take? It depends on the student. The, you know, we've worked with students with extensive support needs. Yeah, it takes a little more time to get down. You, you have to figure things out in terms of how you communicate these things. Students may not be able to answer the questions independently. For other students, they're able to learn the process and, and run with it pretty quickly. So it, it'll vary. Uh, we, we see this as something that you can overlay onto any instruction in any area you're doing. So it sort of augments what you're doing and gives you a framework to use to promote these skills we've been talking about. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of goal. It can be an academic goal. It can be a transition goal. It can be a behavioral goal. It can be a social interaction goal. It doesn't matter. It is self-regulated problem solving. The type of goal is often determined by what you're teaching. If you're a math teacher, then the parameters are they're going to set a goal within what, you're, what they're in that class for, right? Transition, there's probably a broader set of parameters that can impact these. So, uh, so uh, you know, it's applicable for any type of goal. Um, again, uh, we see this as being integrated and, and supplementing uh, ongoing instruction. And I, I hope by the end of the little discussion here, you'll, you'll get a sense of that. Um, 
So um, we do this uh, through a process. So there are, there are three kind of elements of the SDLMI. The first is a set of student questions. Uh, and for each of those phases, there are four student questions. The first phase is what is my goal is the problem to solve. There are four questions. You'll see illustrations of some of this. They, in each phase, they comprise a four-step problem-solving process. The, the questions differ by phase because the problem is different in each phase. But they, in, all, in each phase, there are four questions that relate to the problem-solving sequence. So students answer those questions. Now then, they do that. There's a set of teacher objectives that are linked to each student question. This tells you as the teacher, remember this is a teaching model. In some ways, the student questions get the most visibility, but it's a teacher objective. This tells you what you're teaching and what you're wanting to do to support the student to answer that question. And then for each teacher objective and student question, there's suggested educational supports that you might need to implement. So the fourth question in the first phase it involves uh, setting a goal. If students never set a goal, you're gonna have to teach goal setting, aren't you? It gives you context to teach goal setting and, and you're gonna engage in instruction. So there's gonna be goal setting instruction that happens. So um, I, I'm, I'm giving you this and there are several documents in the wiki, first of all, there's a teacher's guide to the self-determined learning model of instruction that we've fairly recently developed that's a little bit more user-friendly around talking about these things, so that's there. There's a couple other documents. You may even see these. This, the only reason I include this is that, first of all, up here it says phase one set a goal. The student problem to solve is what is my goal? The student questions are down here. The teacher objectives and educational um, uh, uh, supports are right there linked to each one. Um, so students go through this. In phase one, uh, uh, what do I want to learn is the first student question. Um, the teacher objectives tied to that is to enable the student to identify specific strengths and instructional needs in whatever it is, it's transition or if it's an academic content area or social. So students are going through, they think about what they're good at, what, where they need educational supports. Uh, enable students to communicate preference, interests, beliefs, and values. So what, what interests and preferences are related to these things that are their strengths, so we know that. And then, uh, prioritize instructional needs. So you may have to teach uh, prioritization. So those are, that's, that's the meat of the model. You're using those and this question, what do I want to learn uh, to have the students do these kinds of activities. One of the things we tell teachers to do is go through it once. The first time we go through the SDLMI with a, a student, we, uh, we try to set a, a recreation and leisure goal because kids care about recreation and leisure. They don't so much care about math, science, and literacy, right? They care about rec leisure. So we'll use it, we'll teach the process uh, by having them set a rec leisure goal. I've got a story if I have time at the end about that too. Uh, and so uh, the teacher, the student can go through and the teacher can help them reword that question. The question is written so teachers clearly understand what the question is intended to be. But you can help the student reword that so that they understand it. And by the time they've been through it once, they've got a set of questions that have been kind of tinkered with so that they feel comfortable in their, their, their question. Anyway, so you get to the end. The final question in phase one is what can I do to make this happen? The, te the sole teacher objective is to enable student to state a goal and identify criteria for achieving that goal. So that you end phase one by setting a goal, which was solving your problem. Uh, it leads to phase two back up here. Problem to solve is what is my plan? You got four questions, teacher objectives. You get down to here, you've got, you've set an action plan and you've uh, supported the, the student to have a, uh, to implement the plan and to self monitor their progress. That leads then to phase three which is uh, the problem solved is what have I learned? The, the four questions take them through uh, a process of thinking about what have they learned? Have they made sufficient progress? 
If they're not making sufficient progress, do they need to keep working using the same action plan? Or do they need to go back and they need to revise their action plan? So one of the things that students can do, I mean, if they're making adequate progress, fine. But if they're not making adequate progress, they probably, the first level of change is at the action plan. It's like me going to the gym once a month. I need to do better, right? If I want to really impact my cardio. So, uh, so what happens is you go back to phase two and you uh, create a new action plan. So it's a loop. And then if you go back and you change your action plan enough times and you're still not making progress, what it's telling you is, is you've, you've set a goal that's not attainable, right? So you go back up and you revise your goal and go through the process again. So the process is designed so that if you stick with a student, they will eventually come up with a, a goal and an action plan that they can achieve. Um, and that's been our experience with it. And you know, students aren't all that great at setting goals unless they've had lots of experiences. And in a traditional model, you know, a, kid, a kid might say, oh, I wanna be an, my goal is to be an NBA basketball star. Now, you know, the kind-hearted of us, which most of us are kind-hearted, say, well, you know, we don't want to flat out say you'll never be an NBA basketball star, but the likelihood is very slim. And uh, so you say things like, oh, what is it you like about being an NBA basketball star that, you know, that we could talk about? And, you know, and then you kind of go from there, you try to shape it. You don't have to do that here. You don't have to be a dream killer. No more dream killing. You can, you can go in, the kid can set the NBA basketball goal, and they can figure out that they're not tall enough, they probably don't have the right skill set, the blah, 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 blah. And they can go back that up, and they can revise that goal until it's, I want to play in an intramural league, you know, kinds of things. So, so it can be very empowering. And it, there, you know, there should be 100% success in terms of, of, sol of, set, of, of, of achieving a goal if you've, you've kept with the process. Now, um, it changes our roles. For teachers, we become facilitators. We're still a teaching role because kids need to learn how to solve problems. They need to learn how to prioritize. They need to learn how to create action plans. They need to learn how to set goals. There's all sorts of teaching opportunities around these things that we talked about around promoting self-determination in this one uh, frame. Um, uh, and we become a student advocate. Not only are we not dream killers, but we're, we're, we're there and we say, hey, let's, let's do this. You know, let's figure this out. I'm with you. Um, and that's, you know, those relationship issues is, is important. Students, they become self-directed and, and self-determined learners. They can, they're actively engaged. Even if students are needing a lot of support, you're having to use icons instead of words and everything, they're still keeping students at the center of the process. And if you're doing that, then you're doing the best you can to really honor uh, that. They learn to become advocates, and it, it creates relationships around partnership and, and shared goals, right? So um, there, uh, in all of these, there are four uh, student questions. Phase one, what do I want to learn? What do I know about it now? What must change for me to learn? What can I do to make this happen? Uh, as I said, you can, you can go in, you can modify these. You just can't drop one through three and go immediately to what is your goal. The purpose is to teach kids this sort of problem solving sequence. Um, so, uh, you know, it takes some kids longer. Uh, with each question, there are, as I said, a set of teacher objectives, just the, the ones for question one we already looked at, state strengths and instructional needs, enable students uh, to communicate preferences and to prioritize instructional needs. And then there's the, um, uh, the educational support. So uh, students may not know what their strengths. So you may need to work with students to self-assess their interest and their abilities and what they're good at. Give them the via. Talk about what they're good at. You know, find ways to determine what they're good at. Uh, you know, students may not know how to communicate their preferences, communication skills training. Uh, prioritization is a decision-making process, right? So here's a chance to begin to teach, you know, if you have these strengths, but you have these areas of instructional need, which is most important that you start with, right? So uh, there are these. I'm going to, I'm going to, we're just not set up well for the, the, uh, 
the small group work and uh, I'm going to blow through this and then we'll be done. So um, the second uh, 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 section, again, four student questions, teacher objectives. These are the student questions. What can I uh, do to learn what I don't already know? What could keep me from taking action? What can I do to remove these barriers? When will I take action? Again, keep in mind, now some students will do fine with the, the, these things worded this way. Other students, you will have to help them reword it. And you will know how to reword them based upon the teacher objectives, right? So your teacher objectives for student question five, what can I do to learn what I don't already know is to enable students to self-evaluate what they currently know about the goal and what they need to know. So that becomes, uh, you know, you could reword that to even say, uh, something like, what don't I know yet about this goal or something. But, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interaction between you and, and the student. Um, we, um, the third phase, uh, same setup. Uh, what actions have I taken? What barriers have I removed? Uh, what has changed about what I don't know and what uh, do I know what I want to know? And again, the decision-making process, the self-regulated problem-solving uh, leads you sometimes back to the second phase again to reset the uh, action plan. Um, uh, teacher objectives, what barriers have been removed, collaborate with students to compare progress with desired outcomes. So this is, it's, it's called goal discrepancy analysis is in the, in, the, in, the, in the literature. So you're, you're teaching kids to compare what they know right now compared to what they want to know and taking a look at the discrepancy and what they need to do to, 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 to uh, fit that. So um, some of the roles in the uh, SDLMI, uh, you know, the student is at the center of this. These are, uh, we've been, uh, we've worked with students all over the U.S. and in fact, it's a model that's been implemented around the world. Uh, one student said, I know I'm going to reach my goal because I'm trying. Uh, students feel very empowered. Uh, we get, we always do some sort of social validity by talking to students after the study and by uh, talking to teachers. And teachers always say, I'm surprised how well he did. <laughs> you know, even teachers with high expectations, you know, you're, you're putting students in circumstance. And students talk about this, they, they begin to understand because they, it puts them, if you will, in control of their learning. I made progress on my goal because I tried to, uh, and I would do this again, it helped me. Now, the, the story I wanted to tell you about, uh, and then I'll leave with some websites, um, we were working in uh, Plano, Texas. So Plano is a suburb north of Dallas and uh, very affluent. Um, there were lots of pressures on uh, students to have you know, high academic performance. Um, and so we were sort of dealing with that in terms of the, uh, the context. But we were working on the SDLMI and we were working with a young man in this particular case who had um, uh, behavioral uh, issues. He, he challenged the system. Um, and um, so, uh, as I said, when we begin working with a student, we, um, uh, we have them set a, a rec leisure goal because they care about this. So we start off down this path and immediately he identifies uh, severe storms as something he's intensely interested in. And of course, North Texas gets tornadoes. You know, I've lived in Tornado Alley all my life. So, and um, uh, this was the this was before the Weather Channel, when you could turn on any night, time, day, and see severe weather, right? And so, he had learned about and heard about storm chasers. So, you guys have your fair share of tornadoes in Florida. So, so uh, you know, storm chasers are these people that chase storms, chase these wall clouds waiting for tornadoes to break out. They film it. They've got equipment. They're measuring barometric pressure and all sorts of things. Um, and, uh, you know, that's just their thing. Uh, and uh, so he said, you know, he said immediately, I want to become a storm chaser. 
So this is where, in years past, <laughs> we would have said, ah, well, I don't think you'll be a storm chaser. What is it about storm chasing that is of interest to you? I mean, we knew his parents would just, you know, hang us if uh, if we were working with their son to be a storm chaser, right? Plus, you know, you got to have a lot of money. These vehicles and equipment is expensive. You got to have apparently a lot of free time. And you apparently have to have a lack of good sense, right? Because you're chasing it. So, so, but, you know, that's not the way this goes. Uh, in You know, with the SDLMI, we're on board. So we, we started down that. We got to the point of setting that as a goal. And he was, he knew that he couldn't be a storm chaser. He knew some of these factors. He knew his parents would never let him. So he was sort of testing us, I think, to see that. So we kind of backed off. He said, no, I'm, I'm, I probably can't be a storm chaser. Let's, let's think of another goal related to this. Well, we got to investigating. I can't remember whether he found it or whether we found it, but it was working together. Turns out there were storm chaser clubs in Dallas. There were multiple ones, and there was one in the North Dallas area, not too far from Plano. Immediately, that gives us a goal, right? The goal becomes, I want to become a member of a storm chaser club. Your action plan is pretty straightforward. You, you know, that was back when they still had yellow pages and phone books, right? And so you look it up in the phone book, and you make a call and see if what the criteria for participating and, you know, how to get inv invitation and his self-monitoring was just check. I did do that. I did do that. Writing down what he learned, you know, we got to the, 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 the implementation of the action plan within about two weeks. He had made a connection with this storm chasing club in North Dallas. They had invited him to come to their next meeting and there were really no criteria other than a love of severe uh, weather. And so what do they do at these storm chaser clubs? They show the videos that they've, you know, and they talk about this stuff. He showed up. We were, you know, we, we were around for the next three or four months. By the end of that time, he was an actively engaged member of the Storm Chaser Club, and the the the, the mutual the the out the outcomes that were more as beneficial. You know, these were mainly independently wealthy business owners, mainly male because they lack the common sense to do most of anything, right? So, uh, 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 and and these he was he was within a social network then that had a lot of social capital they liked him a lot because here's this young person who's interested in these things who will listen to them who will talk about these things that they're passionate about i'm pretty convinced although i don't know for certain if i'm the transition coordinator i'm getting him a job with one of those people in that in that context uh we would have never gone there never in a million years gone there we would you know um, and except he took us there and the process allowed us uh, to to support him and to take him there. It's just it's amazing. One of the things that you'll learn is that uh, young people will set basically the same goal that you would set for them. They know they know that they need to improve their their uh, uh, their uh, uh, you know performance. They need to show up. Uh, they need to reduce tardies. I'm amazed how many times that students set the same goal that the teacher might have set. So you know it's it, and and again you put the parameters on on what you want to uh, to do. And the other thing I want to point out is is we want to infuse student self direction in as much as possible, particularly through the the uh, action planning. And, and every student needs to have a self-monitoring process. But, but sometimes it's better not to self-direct learning. So I, uh, one more young man we were working with in, in Texas, and um, he, he was, he's a young man with learning disability. This was back where you had to pass a written text and there were no accommodations. So it would have been pre-ADA, uh, and you got a booklet that you had to study and he was just, he had failed the test. He wanted to get a driver's license. He was able to drive. He just couldn't pass this stupid written test. Uh, and a part of it was he was, he just couldn't focus. He wasn't reading the, the, the strategies. You know, he wasn't using good strategies to figure out what to memorize. I mean, if you don't know what to do, you're trying to memorize everything. You're memorizing things that are irrelevant. So as they got the, you know, the, the goal became to pass the written test. 
the action plan was very teacher directed. It was the teacher sitting down and teaching him how to pick out big ideas out of that, blocking this out for him, helping him do that. So it, there wasn't much that he was doing in a self-directed manner, but he had control over the decision that that was the way he was going to learn. And, and you know, he was able to acquire what he needed to know through that process and he was able to pass the test. So. Again, it's, it's not all about students doing everything for themselves. It's about students being in the, in the middle of the process. All right. Um, there's uh, at that same selfdetermination.org website, you can find the teacher's guide to the SDLMI, but it's also in your wiki. So we've got, we've, what we've discovered is, I think this is fairly intuitive. I think teachers who jump in and do it figure it out, but it just sounds more complicated than, than what it really is. And so we've been working really hard. This, this Maryland-Delaware uh, project, one of the elements of that is we're building out uh, teacher supports. We're building out uh, fidelity measures so that, that teachers can evaluate their fidelity with the model. We're building out teacher training materials. We're building kind of, uh, you can get information about uh, how to teach self-monitoring, how to teach goal setting. So we're building all of these resources that will, I, I think, make this much more adoptable by, by teachers and by educators. So that's all going to be coming up. A lot of that will be linked off of this site as we get things going, but the teacher's guide is already out there. Uh, we've been using it. Um, some other websites, there's your wiki, is the PB Works. And of course, this is now uploaded on your wiki site, so all you have to do is really remember PB Works, waymeyer.pbworks.com. The National Gateway to Self-Determination, I showed you that one uh, at the start. So this is, that has videos, it has all sorts of resources. There's the Zero Center website that I talked about. The easiest way to get there might be just Google Zero Center Self-Determination, but that's, that, that'll get you to their, their page. Uh, we've mentioned the Virginia I'm Determined, so that's the, the link to it. It has lots of good resources on that. There's the Project 10 uh, website that sounds like they've got great information. There's other stuff, but there's a ton of resources on these websites. And I didn't, I, I don't know why, the Beach Center, uh, beachcenter.org, which is where my, uh, it has some of the same materials. So you can get to this stuff. It's almost all free or very low or uh, uh, typically no cost. It's out there and um, much of it has a very strong evidence base. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll make one more offer that if there's ever anything I can do to support your efforts, uh, my email is my last name, waymeyer at ku.edu. Just email me. Uh, I, I'm just would be more than happy if you have questions, if you say you mentioned something and I can't find that, I can find where those resources are. You know, I put a lot of this stuff on the wiki, but we still have more stuff. So uh, uh, by all means, get in touch with me. And once again, thank you for all you do and for spending your day here listening to me yammer on. So, and I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Ellen. Thank you.